Welcome. So we got a lot of government here, a lot of OpenStreetMap. Yeah, yeah. Woo, government, huh? Bureaucracy. This is kind of down on that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do some talking, not some walking or working. What, what, what's going on? So, um, yeah, but we, we decided to put together this panel. Uh, Bibiana um, kind of introduced it. So um, she's coming from Portland Primat. So I'll just pass it over to her and we can start it off and then, and then we'll get talking. Okay. Um, in working on this session and designing it, we thought we'd each give um, just a five-minute lightning show to kind of give you guys some background about who we are and what we've been doing. Um, then we're going to go into some questions and hopefully get some feedback and discussions from all of you. We think this is a really important um, subject to be talking about and working on. But um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm B.B. Anna McHugh. And... Um, Let's see, I, um, hang on a second, this is not working, okay. Technical di difficulties. Luckily, I'm here. <laughs> so. Okay, I'm Bibiana McHugh. I started my career in GIS and transportation um, about 30 years ago. For the past 20 years, I've been working with um, GIS, and um, I've been an IT manager at TriMet um, for the past 20 years, and for the past 10 years, I've been a really strong advocate and adopter of GIS, of <laughs> open source and open source software in government. Um, let's see, um, back in 2009, um, we really started taking a look at OpenStreetMap and it was really due to um, the development and implementation of an open trip planner. Um, since then, um, we've really, we've replaced all of the jurisdictional and proprietary um, base maps in our agency with OpenStreetMap, including our bus dispatch and our lift MDT systems at a significant um, cost savings. And this decision was really based on the requirements and a pilot study. Um, we needed a seamless coverage, um, one that supported multimodal routing, and one that was cost effective. And um, it wasn't, OSM wasn't just the obvious solution, it was the only solution for us, and the one that made you know, the most sense. So um, traditional centerline files, um, they're really, for government, um, they've been the base map. Um, but they're really designed for geocoding. And um, they, the format and the data just doesn't support um, multimodal routing with regards to connectivity, um, multi-use paths, um, multi-attributes at intersections like turn restrictions. So basically, in 2010, 2011, we hired um, four college students and um, used jurisdictional data and aerial photography as a reference to improve both the attribute and the geometry. We worked really closely with the OpenStreetMap community. And um, all of our work is documented in, in an online document, the Open Trip Planner um, final report. So this is Ryan Peterson, and he is a GIS technician. And his work is dedicated to OpenStreetMap um, data maintenance and continued work in the seven county area. His salary is actually subsidized by um, external agencies. And he uses um, Spider OSM. It's a free open source software package, and it basically compares any centerline file um, with OpenStreetMap and spits out differences in attributes and geometry. So in the Portland region, we really see um, OpenStreetMap as the larger, co more comprehensive subset for data. And our centerline file and other jurisdictional data sets are subsets of OpenStreetMap um, that um, live in you know, perfect harmony and um, are parallel with each other. 
Um, I hear a lot of um, concerns um, about adopting OpenStreetMap from government agencies. Um, we found that it really is um, much more cost effective um, to improve the data. Um, hiring the students and spending you know, that first year improving it was less expensive for us than um, licensing um, proprietary data for just a one-year period. Um, this is also something putting our resources into something that the public can benefit from. Um, many eyes on the code are better than a few. And we found that the open source community, um, they're really protective of their data. Very few things fall through the cracks. And others with regards to compromise, um, learning new things, um, licensing issues. Does anyone know what this is? It's an adapter. Um, that's my answer to these concerns. So um, keys to success for government and OpenStreetMap. Um, Government, again, you've heard this before um, in Michael's presentation, but government is really, the role for government is a contributing member of the OSM community, not a controlling member. Um, we also have to start aligning our data, licensing issues, and again, um, more information and education. Um, this is something that a lot of us have talked about. What we need is a Red Cross Data Donation Center a place where government agencies can merely sign um, a license agreement to allow their data to be used for OS o OpenStreetMap contributions. Many government agencies, we just can't hire legal counsel. And for us, that's what really, that's what it comes down to. It's very complicated. And a place where the OpenStreetMap community can go to filter the data sets that they want um, to use that are authorized for contributions. And I've always said that 99.9% .9 of the world's problems can be solved with data. And the better the data, the better solutions um, we have for everyone. Thank you. OK. Um, well, Alyssa gets the slides up. I'm Colin Riley. Uh, uh, I guess I'm representing the local rung of the government ladder, or some. People might refer to it slightly differently. Uh, or you could say hyper-local, as I manage GIS here for the city of New York. Um, and I've been around enough. Maybe I'll just go over here so I can. Yeah, that's fine. Um, can I just have my notes? And I've been around enough uh, in government uh, to have seen the data pendulum swing from a culture of not sharing data largely, to uh, a, a more of a culture of open data sharing. Um, although many probably here in the city of New York would say there's still room to, for improvement, uh, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think we're heading certainly in the right direction. Um, what probably some or many don't realize is it can be as liberating for those within government releasing data as it can be for those who are directly um, benefiting from that data release. and those certainly align with my personal uh, opinions. Um, so uh, to me, you know, OSM is sort of open data on steroids, right? Um, and I've always been attracted to it and um, have been glad over the last couple of years that we can actually participate in it. Um, and just really quickly, by a show of hands, who out there does work for uh, a government entity? Okay, so I would say at least 50%. So I'm not just preaching to the choir here. I'm actually people that I could directly input uh, in those sort of things. So uh, a bit about me. I do manage uh, GIS for the city of New York, work on strategy and uh, managing the city's data repository and largely sharing most of that. Um, and I try to get out there and be engaged with the community and not hide behind the government firewall. Um, and we are open and accessible, both data and the software that we use. Um, so to cover some of the OSM projects that we've worked on. Um, uh, my role has largely been the, uh, as an instigator uh, a, and a contributor to these projects. Um, the one I did last year at the OpenStreetMap conference in DC was the buildings and address import for the city of New York. Work with Alex Barth and his team at Mapbox to do that. Um, and more recently, uh, the bike lanes with the local uh, New York City OSM community and, Eric Brelsford will be giving a lightning talk on that. And Eric, you can wave to the 
peop, uh, the community out there. Um, and that's using map roulette to uh, ingest differences of what the city's data is from what OSM has with the intention of improving that OSM data. Um, and so um, also covering where we're going in the future. Um, so we, we hope to use OSM for routing and turn by turn directions. Um, I was hoping to release, uh, to announce a couple of data releases, but uh, not haven't got all the approvals for those yet, but uh, hopefully we'll make making some big announcements in the foreseeable future. Um, we're hoping to pilot GeoGig for using that as a versioning repository. So um, if people want to consume our data and input that into OSM or whatever else, they'll be able to uh, track those diffs and um, do it more easily. And then use MapRoulette to do additional challenges. Um, and so back to audience participation. Does anybody know the unicorn song? growing up, right? No? Okay, I, I must be the only person out here, you know, all right, so anyway, it's cats and rats and elephants, so it's cats and mats and community, right? And so if you look at the picture here with the cat theme here in German, it's, it's pretty easy to translate. It's, Meine Welt is my world, right? But actually, it's, it should be tired, uh, titled Unsere Welt, our world, right? And to me, the OSM data set makes the world a more open and, and better place, so. Um, I'll hand it off to the next presenter. Hi, I'm Barbara Poor. I worked at the U.S. Geological Survey for many years and in fact have been uh, working on data sharing issues in the federal government since 1993. But I just retired, so now I can't really speak truth to power about uh, <laughs> government stuff. Uh, and I'm really happy to uh, follow some excellent presentations this morning, particularly by um, Tom and John, because they kind of laid out the uh, framework that we have to operate in in the government. And the US Geological Survey, as you know, made topographic maps in, on paper for, what, 100 years, 50,000 plus maps all over the country, and they've had quite a time trying to get them, you know, electronic. Um, one of the issues has been this fragmentation of different agencies having different responsibilities for different things. Nobody had a responsibility, or their responsibility was very fragmented for, um, what they call structures. And what we mean by structures are buildings, anything man-made, buildings, bridges, etc. However, in, after 2001, the Department of Homeland Security declared certain essential stru structures, and the USGS has been trying to get those into the map ever since. And as you know, the funding uh, for government organizations of any kind, except for the Defense Department, is going that way. So um, about 2010, a bunch of us thought, well, we could use crowdsourcing to do this. And we had a little uh, meeting. Uh, Steve Coast was there, um, Andrew Turner, a bunch of people in the open data community. Um, and we proposed that they try to crowdsource this, this uh, structure's data. And I can give you more information about that uh, if you want to talk to me. Uh, there's some publications we've done. So we started this experimental project mapping structures around Denver. And as soon as it became successful and we proved that uh, it could be done and that it could be done really accurately using volunteers, uh, they took it away from us. So I don't run this program now, but it's called the National Map Corps. It's online, you can Google it. Um, basically, it's been a huge success, but they've had to accommodate themselves certain respects to OpenStreetMap. Um, we could not directly use the data because of the licensing issues. We have to put out our data in, um, pub in the public domain. So we can't do any kind of share-alike, uh, 
you know, if we take OpenStreetMap data, we can't then put it into that license. Um, in the in the research project that we did, we found um, that it was we had about 25 different types of structures that we were collecting, and we found that it was just too complicated for people, so we, they simplified it to those uh, 10, 10 structures that mostly had to do with uh, public safety. Um, they used uh, geographic names information system, and if you guys are, are familiar with, um, here's the, uh, this is the editor, by the way. Um, I'll go in, back into that in a minute. If you're familiar with the uh, geographic names information system, it's a big database of names, official names, uh, for structures in the country, and um, we brought those points in. Part of that goes into the GeoNames database as well. Um, after we have, we have tiered editing with this system. In other words, we have volunteers, but then we have like series of volunteer editors. So the whole question of what's authoritative, um, instead of relying on the crowd to do that, they're actually um, making it much more structured. In other words, not everybody can edit and check other people's work. You have to have reach a certain level. Um, it's been very successful. They're feeding it back into the GNIS system. So I think via GeoNames, that all that stuff will eventually come into, um, into uh, OpenStreetMap. They have a lot of volunteers. Um, they use some of the techniques we've been familiar with uh, vir the virtual re recognition badges for doing a certain number of um, points. However, it is not a community in that it does not uh, self-identify and talk among themselves, et cetera, et cetera. We've used map challenges, social media, et cetera. Uh, 110,000 points have been mapped in the last uh, two years. And uh, I think there are about 3,000 mappers right now. What is the future? Um, unfortunately, oh, one thing I really forgot. We couldn't use the data, but we could use the software. So we based our editor on Potlatch, too. Um, however, I've learned that they're moving away from the OpenStreetMap Open software, um, and they're using their own editor now. Um, which is disturbing. They're also developing a mobile app. Um, the future, there's also no known plans to contribute directly back to uh, OpenStreetMap, and I think that people on um, a much higher level than me um, need to be persuaded to have a closer relationship with OpenStreetMap. I just want to shout out to Sophia Liu, she and I have worked on crowdsourcing for another project, and also Eric Wolf, whom some of you might know. He helped me with the, the first iteration. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly Cranbeck. I'm a transport specialist at the World Bank, and I'm going to talk about how the World Bank uses OSM to support our government counterparts. Okay, the World Bank is part of the United Nations system. We support global economic development that's sustainable, equitable, and just. The transport team manages a portfolio of $64 billion in loans for transport infrastructure projects, as well as a capacity building and training program for government transport agencies. That's the intro. Now, suppose you had a city of 12 million people where 70% of all trips are made on transit. Let's call it Manila and you want to get somewhere on a bus or plan a stop, what is something you might need? A map! <laughs> but you might be surprised to know that in 32% of the 100 largest cities in the world, government agencies do not have maps of their transit networks. And if you just take the low and low middle income cities, 92% do not have complete maps of their transit systems. As an organization that invests in urban transport, this poses a problem. And it's not just transit maps. 
Our counterparts are so resource constrained that they usually don't have the technical or financial capacity to collect most of the data we need to support transport infrastructure planning and investment, GIS roadmaps, traffic speed information, accidents. So why does the World Bank Transport Team support OSM? Two reasons. The first, OSM provides a very low barrier gateway to a city or even a country's first road GIS map. For example, in the Philippines, we were approached by the Department of Agriculture to produce GIS shape files for the rural road network. Rather than complete these shape files, which would sit on someone's desktop in Manila, we decided to treat OSM as a kind of enterprise solution, a repository that would be accessible by all the different government, local, and federal level agencies to access not just the rural roads, but the whole road network. So we've been working with DevSeed on updating some of the existing OSM editing tools for road asset management. The second reason is OSM provides an opportunity to help us scale open source software that we support that help our traffic management and transport planning agencies do their jobs better. For example, in the Manila, uh, we worked with Conveil to map the transit system, and they developed an Android app that makes it much cheaper and easier to map public transit systems. Also, working with them, we developed an open source tool that uh, will that traffic uh, <laughs> transit agencies can use to edit and maintain these data. And this effort was extremely successful. In addition to producing that map in Manila, these software tools have been used in at least eight different countries to our knowledge. And this is largely made possible because they're based on the OSM. Now, something we learned is that if a transit network hasn't been mapped for many decades, it's going to look something like this, <laughs> which is a mess. And our counterparts don't always know what to do with that. So we've also supported the development of tools for traffic agencies to be able to make sense of these data. For example, we've been working with Azavia on open transit indicators. This is a platform that pulls in transit data, GIS census data, and the OSM to generate comparable benchmarks across cities. What this means is, if you take a place like Nairobi, uh, where the indicators tell us 30% of the low-income population don't live within walking distance of a transit stop, we can simply create a scenario, hey, what if we add a bus route in this low-income area? By how much can we improve that metric? Similarly, my colleagues in Latin America have been working with Conveil on Open Trip Planner Analyst, a tool also designed for low-capacity government agencies to develop alternatives for their transit system to see how they can increase accessibility to, say, jobs by the low-income populations in that city. We also work with accident data uh, this is an image from Cebu where, like throughout most of the Philippines and most of Southeast Asia, accidents are recorded in logbooks. There are thousands of logbooks of accidents in Southeast Asia. So uh, we worked on an open source platform uh, that these agencies can use to record their accidents on an open street map. Now this application is largely just points on a map, but what was surprising to us was how rapidly it scaled. Uh, this platform is now used by the traffic police in Manila and more interesting by the Philippines National Police as their official crime map. And because of this support and rapid scale, we were able to get additional funding uh, to develop with Azavia a more robust platform that will be the road accident reporting and analysis tool for the country. And the World Bank hopes to adopt this in other countries where we work as well. And again, the scale, in part, is possible because of the OSM. And finally, uh, we've been working on a platform for traffic management agencies that takes in GPS data generated by taxis and helps them do travel time surveys and look at real-time congestion. And we're rolling this platform out now in six cities thanks to a partnership with Grab Taxi, a competitor to Uber <laughs> in Southeast Asia. So, to make these applications work, we also have to support the completion of the open street map. So we work with groups like ICT, IATP, and HUT to produce these maps. All of the code uh, that I've showed so far for these applications can be found on the World Bank GitHub site. And in conclusion, that is how our team uses OSM to support our government counterparts. So thank you.
Great, thank you everyone. Um, I'm avoiding a presentation, so I'm just moderating. Um, I thought we, we have some, we, we do have some prepared questions that we ask the, um, everybody to respond to, but I thought we could start by opening it up to the audience to see if there are any specific questions or experiences that you'd like to respond, you know, talk about. Anyone? Uh, uh, somebody has a raised hand. Oh, great. Go ahead. I, I think if you press a button, we can all hear you. Okay. Ah, so um, Transit Wand is actually designed not as a crowdsourcing tool. It's designed as a survey tool for transport agency staff. Um, to build the first base map, we did it the traditional way, working with students from the University of Philippines and GPS data loggers. And you know, the challenge of that project is it is remarkably difficult to build a transit map when you don't have a map. You know, think about that for, for a second. So the students basically hailed any transit vehicle they saw and rode all of them over a period of eight months and were able to map 900 routes. What we found was this method is completely unsustainable for keeping that map up to date. And that's why we supported the development of Transit Wand. What it does is it enables the transport agency staff to ride a route and then that data gets uploaded to our server in the GTFS format and is then editable through this GTFS editor, this um, user-friendly interface. So that's the, thank you. Good question. I, I think we have another question on the floor. I, I don't know. Yeah, green, we got green. I get, hi, thank you so much for, your, um, for all your presentations. My name's Heather, I'm with HOT, um, but I also work and live in Qatar and I was in a meeting where people were trying to figure out how to start, how to start to use OSM for transportation. So my question is, um, I saw during the Nepal response that Chad and his group created a guide for how to map IDP camps. And so I'm wondering, based on your experiences, have you started to think about guides for what you've learned? Like what you've, what you've just imparted is really important for my work professionally, but I think for a lot of people, if they can learn from those best practices, has the World Bank thought about potentially writing, for example, a guide on how did I, how did I implement this? How do I implement it? Or Colin, with your work, like have you, have you started to document those processes so that we can replicate it? Yeah, and I would, I would say, I, I think it's a really good question to kind of work through. Yeah. Yeah, at, at, at all different levels of government. So I'm gonna kind of hand it over to Colin first, and we'll just go down the line. Yeah. Easier. Um, yeah. No, that's that's a very good point. Um, I mean, I, you're you're fairly familiar with OSM and sort of the resistance to do bulk imports, which is kind of why using Map Roulette, where you can sort of you're, you're, you're attempting a bulk import, but you're looking at each individual geometry as it's coming through with a set of eyes, is sort of like the uh, intermediate approach, right? So uh, that was a lesson learned. Um, but in terms of documentation, yeah, I've, I've written a, a blog post about it, but uh, certainly um, a more in-depth uh, write-up is probably warranted. It's a very good point. Um, I spent an entire summer writing the Open Trip Planner final report. It's about 80 pages. Um, and that's exactly why we wrote it, to help other government agencies, um, universities, everything get started. Um, there's an appendix that has everything that we've, um, all of our procedures, everything. So um, again, you guys can just do a search on um, Open Trip Plan or Final Report. Yeah, I'm gonna say something. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody in this room, I mean, especially the people that are here on this panel, like we're all um, the early adopters. I think we're trailblazers, revolutionaries, you know, I could go on and on. Um, and I think that um, in order to set that example um, and um, inspire others, uh, I think obviously challenge will, you know, and triumphs will be part of like the journey, but um, uh, re recording that process um, and sharing it with others, I think is really part of the the, the work that we do as well. So 
Um, I commend everybody on the team and everybody here as well. And it says three minutes, and I've been trying to get your eye. Since we started 10 minutes late, I'm just going to go over, okay? So, executive decision. All right, thank you. Yeah, those other guys, they were talked a lot, a lot, you know, so don't, don't ruin our side. Yeah, I guess I'll just second what Alyssa said. Um, in terms of documentation, you know, we wanted to build some successes first and make sure these attempts worked because I think a theme um, through the sessions in this room anyway has been uh, these initiatives, while they seem very straightforward to this audience, they're not so straightforward within the bureaucracies where we work. So we really have to prove that the things work. But actually, I guess we're at the stage where we really should be doing a better job documenting and sharing knowledge. So I think it's good you raised that point. Uh, we did a, a report on the experimental phase of our project. Uh, we didn't go through every single procedure, but I think you can get an idea from that. Um, I don't know what to tell you to search on. Talk to me if you're interested. Um, what, it, what occurred to me, though, was there's now this federal community of practice for citizen science, which has representation from all the agencies, and that might be a really good vehicle to um, start to compile some of these resources. And uh, I, I know Sophia is involved with them, so if you want to talk about that with her, that would be awesome. Yeah, sorry, I have one other statement. I, 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 you know, Mikkel was saying that, you know, the government really likes to talk, 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 talk. Sometimes they get work done. I think what government, my experience with government is that they're really good at writing reports um, as well. So I would encourage anybody here um, that's, you know, part of government to, um, when they're not talking or working, um, to actually, you know, kind of write and, and, and compile resources. We have a question in the back here. There are buttons being pressed. On? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Patrick from MapGit. Um, I just had a quick comment about like lessons learned and uh, tracing guides. I think one of the things we're trying to do with the GitHub repo is modularize tr tracing guides, so you can really consume like lessons learned in like bite chunk, you know, you know, bite uh, small chunks at a time, right? So you don't have to read like an 80-page report. And I, I think that's definitely a direction. Uh, we need to go, and hopefully, you know, at the end of projects, you know, the outcome isn't an 80-page report, but you know, um, you know, a guide that people can consume very easily, and not they don't need to sit down for like two hours to read it. Um, it has lots of diagrams and it's double-spaced. <laughs> uh, yes, we have a question in the back here. Being for my, uh, it's right now. I'm, I'm Alex I'm with Mapbox and the OpenStreetMap US chapter. Uh, one of the things that would be really great, I think that storytelling and like uh, sharing experience part is very, very important because these anecdotal stories of like what you guys all do are really amazing and inspiring for many more people working in government or similar organizations to implement similar programs. Um, work with uh, the community and like the forums around here to get your story out. Um, there are, you know, like, uh, we on OpenStreetMap US, we run a blog. Uh, we can help you, like, to actually, you know, talk to the right people in the space to, like, you know, amplify your story to really make sure that, um, you know, the right people hear about it. Yeah, I mean, I think having talked with everybody before, I feel like um, the work, like, the relationships with the community um, and how... Uh, each of these initiatives, so the initiatives represented here, um, kind of worked with the OpenStreetMap community, um, influenced this, uh, like the success and challenges of the, of the work. I, I wonder if it would be useful to kind of go again by the panel and talk about um, sort of the relationship with the community or, and that community being us. So, Sure. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a... A very important point. I mean, I tried to get out there and, as I said, sort of break down the, the government firewall. I mean, there's plenty of events, geo-related events, not necessarily OSM-specific here in New York City, that Alyssa has her hand in many of them. Um, Geo-NYC, MapTime, NYC, you know, even Beta NYC. Um, so I, I try, when I can, to uh, present at these and, and attend these and sort of, you know, hear what the community is, is 
is feeling or, or, or interested in and sort of trying to respond to that, you know, instead of just, you know, because the public is one of our clients, if you think of government serving, right? It's not just other city agencies, the public at large. And if you're not out there, then how do you know what is being said or what is being asked for? Um, I'm going to give you two really quick examples of um, our work with the community. Um, the first one is uh, you really, we did a lot of research up front and we were very involved um, online and we also had open houses and met a lot of the, the local users. But early on we made a very junior you know, mistake. We started um, the usernames with TriMet. And um, it's really about um, attributes need to be tagged by people, not organizations. So that was um, kind of one example. Um, another one is, um, um, oh, uh, compromise with regards to data attributions and really knowing what the needs of the communities are and being respectful of that. Um, for instance, um, in our community, a lot of people tagged multi-use paths with just cycleways. Um, rather than, you know, um, oh, go down that road, we merely just changed our code. So um, it really is a relationship and um, you act as a member. Um, in terms of how we engage the OSM community, uh, if it's an existing community, we'll, we'll hire them. <laughs> um, and if it's a new community where we work, we'll support training. Um, so that when we leave, there'll be a, a critical mass of people who can help keep the maps up to date. And the training usually targets students and government staff. Um, the person that really worked most closely with the um, OpenStreetMap community when we started was Eric Wolf, uh, who knew a bunch of the people in this room, probably. Um, but we. I don't think that there's an ongoing relationship anymore, which is kind of sad. And, and as a follow-up, I mean, I feel of potentially the projects presented, like you, you kind of encountered some of the, 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 the highest challenges. Do you think that perhaps like the investment in the community relationship um, influence like also the effectiveness of the program for, within the agency? There's a huge investment in the current structure that exists within the USGS that has an insistence on um, having this kind of hierarchy of people. And they don't fully realize that the OpenStreetMap is a different kind of community that might make a different model I think it goes back to what um, John was saying. Um, you know, these institutions have that they're he's called it code, but it, it restricts how they think about things. It was much easier for Sophia and I to actually talk to scientists about using crowdsourcing, and they were like bought into it immediately. But Matt. The mapping division did not. But there's hope. I mean, there are people, uh, you know, the young people, they're coming up through the ranks, so there is hope. Great. Are there any questions, or don't you want to see my slides with cats on them? I mean, a, there, there we go. Uh, is, there, is there a question in the back? I'll just, I'll just go through these cat photos. So. <laughs> Philip. Um, hi, so I'm Phil uh, Ashlock with uh, data.gov. Um, my general understanding is the two of the biggest um, impediments to sort of better collaboration between government uh, and OpenStreetMap community is uh, licensing compatibility, which was brought up earlier, and also just the idea of you know any kind of bulk contributions being kind of antithetical to the culture and process of individual contributions. Um, and some of this might be more specific, I mean, particularly with licensing uh, to the federal government, but. I guess I'm just curious if there, if you see any initiatives to sort of address those head on, or if, if there's even consensus that those are, in fact, the main problems and agreement on even just, you know, admitting what they are and making sure that we're all clear that, that those are problems. 
I'd really like to see you, Philip, step <laughs> up. <laughs> okay. And um, <laughs> um, I really think that governments, it's, it's too costly to hire legal counsel. Um, in our area, we spent so much time trying to figure it out that finally we just slapped the same license OSM is on our data to make sure there weren't any issues. And again, I really think that there could be a house where government agencies can merely sign a terms of use, um, something very simple um, that lines everything out, and um, um, you know we can go forward with that. Um, but until all data, all, all government data is a public domain, you know it's going to be an issue. And I would also say I think also businesses have a responsibility and, and potentially the, the means to help with that. Any other takers on the panel? Legal, legal. Oh. Wait, it's, it's green, so I think it needs to be red. Like turn me red? There you go. Oh, amazing, okay. Quick public service announcement. Uh, I don't want to cut the discussion short. Um, it's, uh, we're going into lunchtime, which is fine, but when you go to lunch, uh, the way how you get there is when you leave this conference room, you turn right and you pass, you, you walk past the exhibitor space. You keep going straight and you'll walk out the building and you'll walk into the next building. There will be volunteers posted to guide you along the way. And will you be uh, around to, to guide our way? Like, we, we, are you gonna say for, we're gonna, we'll kind of close up in two minutes. So you, you can also lead us, right? Because I don't know how to get there. Um, I'm, I'll have to skip right now, and oh, you guys okay. should All take right. your Do time. Do not follow Alex. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah, we're gonna close up in, in just a little bit. Are, are there any other questions? Or I can show you another cat. So, a le left. I've, I've got a question about um, government oh. engagement. So, government engagement to make most of the um, applications that you're talking about happen. Um, so I come from Nigeria, and it's very difficult to get the government to use what you built. So what happens is you put a lot of efforts to build these things, and then the government doesn't use them. So in what ways um, have you guys ens you know, ensure that these things that you build, and you, especially for the World Bank, especially and in developing countries. So in what ways and what strategies do you use to actually first get government participation and buying in building um, um, these tools and um, the data and the application, and then for continuous use by the government to make decisions? Yes. <laughs> so I guess a few things. Um, first, uh, when it comes to developing open source software, uh, that never comes out of loans. We don't want our counterparts to pay for these things that are risky and may not work and that we intend to use in lots of places. So the work is all grant funded. Uh, second, we only work with our existing counterparts where we already have projects and where these tools will fulfill a need in our project development. Um, so for example, in the Philippines, we have bus rapid transit projects in Manila and Cebu. In Manila, the big issue was because the government didn't know where the existing transit network was, it was really difficult to design a new BRT because we didn't know how it could connect with the existing system. So in order to solve that, problem, we could have just hired an international consultant to make the map and say, here you go. But what we wanted to do was do something that was a little more sustainable, so that after that BRT is built, the local government could continue to update that map over time. Um, so that, that's the approach. One, grant funding, and two, we leverage existing projects uh, and use the inputs from the counterparts in the design. So how long ago did you hand over to the government and what is the current state 
after handing it over to the government? Is it improving? Are they actually doing what they should be doing to keep it updated? Yes. Or have they just dropped it? So, of the initiatives I presented, so far we've only finished one of them. Uh, the rest are still in progress, so I can't speak to them. But the one we finished was the, the transit mapping in Manila. And so that one, um, yes. <laughs> so if you go to the Department of Transportation website, uh, you can download the updated transit map. Uh, we've been tracking, and there are updates that have been made to the map since we finished the project by the Land Transport Franchise Bureau, uh, responsible for the buses. But more importantly, um, they use that map to develop a jeepney route rationalization plan. Uh, they spent a year developing that plan, and they're reducing the number of jeepney routes, microbus routes, by 40%. And that's being implemented over a two-year period where as the route franchises expire, they just let them go and introduce new routes. So it's a good example of how um, we made the map, they're able to update the map, they made it publicly available, and they're able to use it for uh, a good development outcome. Thank you. So. I mean, I think we are um, good for lunch. I, mean, I don't know if anybody else is hungry. But uh, I think this is a really great conversation to have started, and I encourage us to um, do a breakout session later, um, a birds of feather around government and open street maps. So we'll put that on the board, and hopefully we'll be talking again soon. So thank you.